Welcome back. This is a key point. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. I'll quickly introduce a panelist for this part of the conversation where we're looking at our fight against Galamse and how far we have come. From my extreme left, we have Brigadier General Daniel Mishu. He is the former chairman of the National Security Committee on Lands and Natural Resources. Next is Mr. Emmanuel Juinchi Entry. He is the Director of Operations with the Ghana Small Scale Miners Association. And to my right, we have Mr. Bobby Banson. He is a legal, a private legal practitioner. Good morning, gentlemen, Good and welcome morning. to the show. Thank Happy you. Easter, by the way. Thank <laughs> you very much, safety. Great. So we'll take um, a listen to the Senior Minister, Mr. Yao Osafumafo whilst he was addressing a town hall meeting um, in the United States of America. Indeed, this particular soundbite has, has, has made the headlines uh, the whole of the week, and we'll be starting off our conversation with a look at that particular statement he made. Uh, let's take a listen, and we will return to the panelists in the studio. A very good relationship with China. They're the main company that is helping to develop the infrastructure system in Ghana is Sino Hydro. It's a Chinese company. It's the one that's going to help process our bauxite and provide about two billion dollars to us. But when there are these kind of arrangements, there are other things behind the scenes. Putting that lady in jail in Ghana is not going to solve your economic problem. It's not going to make you not happy or me happy. That's not important. The most important thing that has been deported out of Ghana. So we must say it's not wrong. I'm saying that there are many other things beyond what you see in this matter. And everybody is wide away. The most important thing is that we have found this established location and we are protecting our country. And we have a far more important than one Chinese woman who are more important. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So that was Ms. Ayosa Fuma for there speaking at that town hall meeting in the United States of America. Clearly, um, the members of the audience were not, you know, really um, in tune with what he was saying. You could hear them say, set an example, set an example. I'll start with you, Big Brigadier General. The comment the senior minister made that um, jailing you know, the, 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 the notorious Chinese <laughs> illegal, you know, mining operator, you know, the person of Aisha Huang, would not necessarily solve our problems, our economic problems. So why bother? The most important thing is to have her deported, which the government did, and so we should carry on. What, what, what do you make of that comment? Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to your viewers. I believe this is rather very unfortunate. Mm. And the reason is that the law Act 900 of 2015 clearly states that a foreigner who is involved in illegal mining should go in for not less than 20 years imprisonment. So if for any reason a, mes a message like that goes across, it gives very wrong signals to even those who are engaged in illegal mining in Ghana. And I think this is rather unfortunate, and that should be corrected. Mm. Yeah. But the, the, the justification he's making in the, in, the t in, the, in the sense that there's a Sino-Hydro deal coming in, and so you're looking at you know, all, all manner of things that go behind the scenes, you don't think those are tenable? Well, I, I don't believe that that is the best solution to mm. our problems. Mm. I think that we have so many problems, and just let me just hint you that as far back as 2013, Ghana was losing more than $500 million a year. And therefore, I mean, if we, were, we wanted actually, if we were serious about this illegal mining, we could have saved enough. And mm. I, at any rate, does that mean that any time we are going to get money from any country and the nationals, their nationals are involved in this, they are going to be freed mm. whilst Ghanaians are jailed? I don't think that is the best thing. Very well. Quickly, let me come to you, Manuel, your, your, your perspectives on this. You are in the sector. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, it's rather unfortunate uh, that the Honorable Minister made such statement. And uh, for the fact that he sought to um, 
justify, you know, because uh, we are in this country when this whole fight against illegal mining, um, the Vanguard reported um, arresting several hundreds of yeah. small scale miners who otherwise um, they didn't have anything to rely on. In fact, they were just looking for butter and bread, but we were arrested and then um, some were prosecuted, some are still in jail. And so one would have thought that uh, for somebody as Aisha or Galamse Queen, to put it <laughs> right, um, the state would have rather invested in resources to prosecute such a case and then make an example out of it for people to know the seriousness of the government and the commitment of the government in dealing with the Galamse issue. And one key thing, you know, deporting her, I believe it's, it's not enough. And in fact, I'm speaking the mind of the association because um, if this case had been prosecuted properly, we would have seen a lot of networks that Asha controls in this country. Mm -hmm. And that would have <coughs> helped us track such networks so that we can actually, um, 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 you know, destroy or take off that network. Mm. And that would have helped us a lot in the fight against illegal mining. Because um, the, the illegal mining menace gained prominence when the Chinese came in. And Asha controls quite a chunk of that, that network. Mm. And so it was important for Ghana, it was an opportunity that Ghana have missed. Right, now Bobby, your perspectives on this. Clearly, I mean, listening to the senior minister trying to justify it in respect of the Sino-Hydro deal that was coming in, question that comes to mind is, yes, the Sino-Hydro deal is coming in, but that isn't even for free. They're coming to, so assuming that, yes, we were depending on them for something, question is, are we even getting that, what they're giving us for free? We're not. So then wherein lies this question about, well, we had to, you know, do or place the cards in a certain way in order to get the sign hydro deal. We're not getting it for free, are we? Well, um, it's, it's the statements are, every right-minded Ghanaian will condemn those statements. Mm -hmm. What saddens me is an attempt by, there's a Facebook account, I hope it's not mm. his, that is tagged the office of the senior minister trying to further justify these statements and saying that he didn't say it like that. Mm. It's been taken out of context. He meant Ghanaians should concentrate on the economics mm -hmm. of the nation instead of only one person. But you've played a full trick. Mm -hmm. And you cannot decouple the, the statements he made from the economic benefits we get from China. So we should let her go. For me, it, it's, what baffles me is that this Sino, Sino deal was recently announced. But this Aisha woman's matter had been from last year. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that when she was arrested, they said, OK, we'll give you this deal, and then you, you go about it? Now, I've also read a comment from the Chinese ambassador oh, yeah. who said that they were not even aware that she was deported. The Chinese embassy here was not consulted. They don't know anything about it. All they heard was that she had been deported. Mm. So it puts everything that the politicians have said, or the senior minister has said, in a very weird perspective. For me. What the director of operations of the Small Scale Miners mm. Association said is very key. And that is where I, I agree with him that we missed a huge opportunity. Right. And it shows that we do not have political will. Is he, like he said, when the woman was arrested, a very senior uh, journalist in this country said he doubts the woman would ever be prosecuted mm. because she has enough information on a lot of senior political figures in this country and that she has threatened that if they dare attempt to prosecute her, she's going to blackmail them. Right. It's on record. He said it. Mm -hmm. And so we were not surprised that this happened. Now, it is true that, you see, and General, with respect to your, uh, the Act 900, it's the Chinese, like they said, they do not come to Ghana and start going from village to village asking for, where do you have gold? Can we mine? It is Ghanaians who bring them. Aisha was married to a Ghanaian. I know that for a fact. Mm. She was married to a Ghanaian. And so that's influenced some of these things, how she managed to go around some of these things. If the Ghanaians who form the network are left off the hook, she may have been taken out of the country, but she will still be controlling right. what was happening. Remember, the illegal Galamse came with a lot of arms. 
There were issues of villagers being shot by Chinese mm -hmm. on farms. All these arms, all these things were linked to Aisha. Almost every Chinese who was arrested will mention her name. That is why she was tagged as the queen. She wasn't tagged as a queen only because she's a woman. <laughs> it was because all these things were, ev almost every person who was arrested was, was uh, linked or mentioned her name. And you know, if you want a visa to Ghana as a foreigner, it's either you take the visa from the Ghanaian embassy there, or you take visa on arrival. If you take visa on arrival, which most of these Chinese do, somebody must have applied, a Ghanaian or a Ghanaian entity, must have applied and then guaranteed your stay here mm. would be in accordance with the immigration, Ghana Immigration Act. Right. Who are these Ghanaians that continue to apply for these visas and guaranteed the stay mm. of these Chinese? Once we let her go, we have seemingly taken off a figurehead, but the network still remains. And it's obvious, the Galamse is still ongoing. Right. It's very obvious. I think we missed a huge opportunity. The political leadership should be ashamed of what they have son, mm -hmm. said or what they have done. I think the senior minister should apologize. There's no need justifying all of these. And if something must be done to clear all these hurdles, I think they should. And it's, it's, it's a shame. It, I mean, it's a shame that you see, I, I, I was in Kigali once and on the flight back, I was on a plane with a Chinese. We actually left our hotel together. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, he said he was going to Lagos. So I asked him, how do they survive in Nigeria, in other countries? Because we have a lot of issues in Ghana with Chinese. <laughs> and he told me point blank that we Ghanaians have allowed the Chinese to do everything. Right. In Kigali, the laws are such that you cannot litter the place. So he said, look, in this country, because what, the reason I asked him was that he drank something and then he packed it nicely. nicely. <laughs> so I said, this is because Chinese this notion that Chinese are quite, forgive me, they, they are indiscriminate when it comes to these things. He says they act according to the country they find themselves in. Right. And the ambassador said the same, same thing. thing. Exactly. He did. It, the Chinese yeah. are all over the world. Yeah. But if they go and you allow them to do what mm. you, you want them to mm. do, then they'll take you for granted. Right. So yes. I think that this, this statement undermines the very efforts by the National Galamse, the, the tax force, yeah. because what it means is that whenever you arrest a Chinese, you must the the politics. If we've arrested Lee Wan Chong, what should we do to him? <laughs> should we let him go because we are getting Sino, or should we let him go because they are giving us money? Yeah, I think that they, they should come clear on this. Very and, and well. I mean, uh, you, you raised the issue about the Chinese ambassador. Clearly, what he said is in sync with what your Chinese, the person you met on the flight, said. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting him here, this is um, a transcript, that we don't know where your gold is. We don't issue visas too for the Chinese people coming to Ghana. Ghanaians issue the visas. Ghanaians aid the Chinese to where they can find your gold. Why are Chinese not doing illegal mining in South Africa where there is also a lot of gold? Because they cannot do that there and the locals don't support such illegalities. He stated, Imano. Yes, I mean, um, that is logic, mm -hmm. uh, basically. Um, and you can't fault him for saying that. Exactly. Uh, in fact, I agree with him 100%. And so is, I mean, every other diplomat in any other country. The point is our laws must work. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we should not just um, say that because we are getting a certain assistance from a certain country, so we should treat their citizens differently when they flout our laws. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. And so if I were the, the Chinese ambassador, I would have said the same yeah. thing. Our laws must work. Um, the, the security agencies in this country, the, the government, the politicians, look, we need to get our ass together. We need right. to get our ass together. Right. Clearly, Brigadier, where the, where, I mean, clearly this, is, this, this, <coughs> this flies in the face of all the efforts we've put in so far in terms of, you know, trying to deal with the situation. Clearly... Would, it would douse NGs people have talk about civil society, you know, who are all fired up to deal with this issue. It would definitely be a damper in our, in our fight against Galamse, wouldn't it? I just start by saying that these are sad times <laughs> in our, really, our fight against illegal mining. I believe that the, the zeal and the efforts that our forebearers used to fight for independence. If Ghanaians are committed to fighting like that, I think we could easily get rid of illegal mining in Ghana. Because very few people can, can be exonerated 
right from the village level, the chiefs, the opinion leaders, businessmen, politicians, ministers, they are all involved. Illegal money does not occur anywhere, but in, in villages and lands owned by chiefs, mm. and there are people who own the land. Nobody can say that they don't know that illegal mining is taking place in their area. Right. So it is really sad. Right. Totally sad. And for me, the, the, the part that saddens me the most is that, indeed, there appeared to be some successes. I mean, going by what the Ghana Water Com um, Company Limited even said in terms of how, you know, they um, treated their water. Because according to them, it cost them so much to, you know, treat water. But then when this fight against Galamse peaked, there was a certain improvement. And so in terms of how much they would put into, you know, the water production or water treatment, they, they saw a certain level of, you know, um, um, decrease in there. So that spoke volumes. Indeed, the public relations officer, I believe, of Ghana Water Company on several occasions did mention that, yes, they had seen some, you know, improvement uh, in, in that sector. But in recent times, we're hearing that, well, it seems we're going back. <laughs> Clearly suggesting that, you know, something is going to miss. I'm not surrprised that it's, it's going that way because if clearly we don't have the commitment, these things will definitely come back. But I want to ask Emmanuel, the ban on <laughs> small-scale mining was lifted not too long ago, in December. Do you think that has had an effect in terms of how we're doing, you know, the successes we're achieving? Do you think by going back, allowing small-scale miners, then there's been a certain infiltration of, you know, these illegal operators? Not at all. Mm. Um, not at all. In fact, whilst the ban was in place, the illegal miners were having a few days. They were happy mining. Uh, there has been several reports mm. that, that talks about the fact that the rate at which it was um, mined We've seen, we haven't seen that in this country before. And that happened during the ban. So during the and ban, they were having a field day, you're saying? Exactly. Meanwhile, Operation Vanguard was on, was on the field. Yes. I, I mean, so maybe let me, let me just um, uh, change the discussion a bit. Okay. Uh, approach to, to the fight against illegal mm. for instance. Um, let me give a little background about if I have the time. There are three major cause, causes of illegal mining. Let me put it that way. Normally, I don't want to call it illegal mining. I want to call it informal mining. Mm -hmm. The drivers, one, is purely poverty. People are stuck in villages where we have minerals. And these people, for generations, the trade they know is mining. Let's take uh, a town like Oboise and its environs. For close to over 100 years, Anglogold, or Anglogold has been there, or there's been large scale mining, mining activities, in, yeah. activities in there. And these concessions were granted over several towns around an Oboise inclusive. And we had a lot of indigents who had skill in mining. The day those concessions were granted. Those people were rendered illegal miners automatically. Meanwhile, their main skill or their main trade is mining. So that is number one. How but they we were not using. They were not using the is it the technology or the devices that necessarily you know or that impact negatively on our environment. You know, talking about the shamfangs and all of that. Yeah, society develops, society right. improves mm -hmm. over, over periods. So, of course, um, they may be using rudimentary equipment and all that, but things have improved, mm -hmm. so we can still use it. At the same way, I, I'm, I'm very sure that, I mean, those times when um, we established the, the, the University of Mines, I mean, yes, it wasn't university, it was a part of KNUSD, right. yes. mm -hmm. but it's now university. What Mines, it means yes. is that they are training more sure. um, professionals and all that. And so whilst technology is... Um, developing and increasing, more professionals are also being trained mm -hmm. and all that. So the point I was trying to make is this. Um, when poverty to how we grant concessions in this country, we total disregard to indigents and those who have skill in that. 
And then the final one is also how we monitor or how we do regulation in, in, the, in the country. Now, if, and this is the view of the association, if government really was committed in fighting this menace, the first step was not to criminalize the sector, the, those who are doing illegal mining, not at all. Because these are people who are trying to find butter and bread to keep body and soul together. But to the extent that it's causing serious havoc to the environment, you don't think it should be regulated in that manner? I'm coming there. Very well. So we have enough laws, but if we really, and we are serious about putting measures in to make the laws work, we could have done that. Example, Minerals Commission, for instance, the whole of Oda, Oda, the, the mining district Oda, is supposed to take care of the whole of Eastern region, part of Central region, and then part of um, Greater Accra region. And in that office, we have only one Minerals Commission officer mm. with a driver and one pickup. Within that enclave, we have about um, 200 licensed small-scale miners and perhaps over 400 illegal activities mm -hmm. in there. How do you expect such an officer with one pickup and one driver to go around first on the licensed miners and ensure that they do the proper thing mm -hmm. and then come to the illegal miners as well? Mm. The police, they, they were also under resource in all those areas. Mm -hmm. But you see, when we, we start, when we wanted to fight illegal mining, mm -hmm. we decided to put together some 400 um, military men and police and spent over 50 million Ghana cities over a shorter period, about six months or so. It was totally, the resources were totally, you know, misdirected towards what we're supposed to do, because we had already state institutions that are mandated by law to act. So if we had 50 million, we could have resourced them, open more minerals commissioning offices, mm. get more officers in there, give them logistics, and perhaps they needed training if they don't have, so that they can go down there first, make sure that the licensed ones comply to lay down regulations, identify the illegal ones, and perhaps have targeted sensitization and education towards them. Because these are people who are only looking for butter and bread. Mm. Look, when this whole thing started, the association went wrong, trying to gather some of these illegal miners. And some of the videos are there. Maybe one of the days I'll bring it for you to play. The guys were just ready to do anything that the government want them to do. So there was no need for Vanguard in the first place. There's no way Ghana can sustain Vanguard. It's too expensive. But so was a crisis, there money? was a crisis management thing. You don't think so? And there was a certain period that required that level of action. My personal opinion, there was no crisis. Yeah. There wasn't any crisis. Mm. This water issue and all that. I mean, let's ask ourselves. Let's be frank and true to ourselves. When was the last time um, Ghana Water changed uh, most of their major equipment that they used to do treatment in this country? You know, there are, sometimes we, we pick and choose certain things to fit a certain situation, mm. and we paint the picture we poor thing in society. Let me, let me quickly go to Brigadier for your perspective. You've heard, you've heard the points um, uh, Iman has raised. You don't, you, do you or do you not think that there was a crisis and that required a certain level of action to deal with it, and then subsequently, you know, we go to normal times and then operate accordingly? I think that the whole issue had to do with lack of proper assessment of the situation mm. and coming up with a comprehensive and practical plan. Mm -hmm. In the past, what we did was to do an assessment of the situation. And I just would like to recall that as far back as 2010, Dr. Tony Oben, mm -hmm. in an advocacy document, which, and they did a research and came up with the situation that he's talking about and made suggestions. And so what we thought was that fine, if the, immediately you felt that something had to be done about a problem, you can take immediate steps. That's a short-term measure. But you should also have a medium-term and long-term measure to ensure that your fight against illegal mining is not only sustained, but that you are successful. Mm -hmm. And so as far as I'm concerned, I think that there was a lack of professional planning. Mm -hmm. And you see, in the fight against illegal mining, it is not just, excuse me, say government or, or a ministry. It is supposed to be 
there are stakeholders involved in this. And what we did at the time was to involve the Environmental Protection Agency, the Minerals Commission, Small Scale Miners, the Chamber of Mines, all the security agencies had rules to play. The military had its role to play. The police had its role to play. BNI had its role to play. And national security had its role to play. And so what we did was to come up with a comprehensive plan that tabled short-term, medium, and long-term plans. Unfortunately, I mean, all has been thrown out. And we cannot continue in this way. We cannot continue to reinvent the wheel. Let's go back to see what has been done in the past and what we can do to sustain it. But the argument is that what was done in the past didn't work, and so we needed to change our strategy. I mean, you don't well, go is that back true? to... But if, 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 if it did work, we wouldn't have had the situation we had on our hands, which required a certain level of action, would it? The whole issue has to do with commitment, mm. patriotism, and getting professional people. I mean, the integrity of those who are running it is very important. Yeah. <laughs> so if Definitely. you don't, if you have people who are out there just to make money, to line their pockets, there is no way that any law that you ever implement will work. Exactly. So I think the long and short of it is that let's go back to the table, sit down, get the stakeholders involved, mm. do detailed planning, and come out with a plan that will, will Very well. Imani, you want to quickly, yes, yes, quickly, then I'm going to break. How do you fight illegal mining? By banning licensed people. Mm -hmm. People who out of this booming, the seemingly booming mm. illegal mining activities, painstakingly went to Minerals Commission to license their operations. By licensing, they just submit themselves that, look, whatever you want to do to regulate us, we are ready for it. Mm. And those people who have done that, instead of them giving medals, they were banned. For over 24, 22 months, they were at home. Now, when the ban was lifted, there have been a lot of impediments mm -hmm. put on their ways so that they cannot go in there. Which impediments are these? For instance, now as we speak, you cannot um, renew your licenses. Mm -hmm. You cannot renew your permits because certain instruction hasn't come. Two, those who had new licenses. So if, 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 your, if your permits or um, license expires, then you're not to, be, to work. Yeah. Yeah, you know that because the, the then, ban lasted for two years. Yes, and some permits is for a year. Uh -huh. Others two years. Um, EPA is for two years. Uh -huh. Begin permit is for one year, and then the license is for five years. So we have some people within the the license um, group that had about a year of their licenses to expire. Uh -huh. We have those who had less than a year for the EPA, uh -huh. and those who had less than um, three months for their digging permit, and then the ban came. So after the lift of the ban, automatically, all these permits have expired. But they have not given them the chance it's to, not been renewed. To, to renew. And one, so they are not working. That's they're, what, not, they're not working. Right. And one sad thing is, you know, those who had their licenses signed on or after um, June 2016, all of them are not supposed to go back to work. Mm -hmm. but I find it so strange because some had their licenses processed in, in 2013, 2014. Mm. And the government seems not to bother about this. So how do you fight illegal mining mm. when you target the people who have licensed their document mm. Mm. and their operations? Right. Big, big, big issues coming up. But Bobby, <laughs> <laughs> let me see. A number of things have come up. I would want us to look at them. But we'd also need to look at the roadmap that the interministerial committee, you know, put in place to help with this whole, you know, th th their argument was, yes, let's ban Mm. everything in the in the in the small scale mining sector so that we can streamline things and better regulate you know within a certain framework so that's there whether or not it was prudent or whether or not it worked is another conversation to be had altogether but looking at the roadmap the issue that Emmanuel is raising I think features in there because there are a number of things that government said was doing and in any case the ban was lifted after government said that certain um, strategies outlined in the roadmap had been mm -hmm. implemented. So again, the question arises whether or not the roadmap, the implementation of the roadmap itself was successful mm -hmm. according, mm -hmm. uh, or in, in accordance with what government is saying. But regarding the licenses, there was supposed to have been a vetting and verification of licenses of all small-scale mining companies. And at the time, I believe December last year, some 1,350 small-scale mining companies were declared vetted and verified. So how do we reconcile that with the situation that we have currently, well, which is that, well, 
some are not able to work because they've not had their licenses renewed and all of that. Mm. The, the numbers that the committee, he, he can verify. Yes, I doubt at the time we discussed it, we said <laughs> this was just, I mean, it was just way, 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 way low. That it was no, a I mean, now they've mentioned 1,000. 1,350. You know, the 1,350 yes. were the, those who were supposed to have submitted their licenses for the vetting. Mm -hmm. Then after that, the, the International Committee declared that over 900, a little over 900 submitted and were vetted and verified. Okay. Out of this, about half of them have not been able, they've not been able to map their concessions because of certain um, reasons that the mm. International mm. Committee mm. has given. Mm. Mm. And so now, technically, we have a little over 400 that have gone through the vetting <laughs> successfully. And out of that, a certain number are not able, in fact, a very small number are the ones who are able to go back to work. Right. And even them, they would have to um, um, put tracking devices uh -huh. on their uh -huh. equipment uh -huh. at uh -huh. a fee. Yeah. Uh -huh. These are uh -huh. bottlenecks and impediments. Mm. Expensive. Uh -huh. And expensive, you know. Right. Look, if you want to formalize a sector, you don't raise barriers. I get it. Well, we'll, okay. be, we'll be, yes. Let me, let me, let, let's, first, let's first, that I, I just want to make it clear, mm -hmm. and I said it on this platform, that I didn't agree with the whole strategy that they came up with. And my reason, the law has not changed, even with this interministerial, the mm -hmm. laws on mining Still have not changed. Thing, Listen, yeah. if you, and I've gone through the process in my professional work before, if you apply for a small scale license, mm -hmm. you must get all your permits, you must submit a reclamation plan very very key to show the extent that your work will affect the environment and how, you and how being responsible about it all yeah it's it's very key if your plan is not feasible they should not grant the license mm. the issue for me has always mm. been about monitoring and enforcement like yep. he said if you have order only one officer with one vehicle how would he drive from there to the hinterlands to go and confirm whether they are doing the reclamation. For me, it, and it is still in the law, this mm. whole ministerial up and down boils down to one thing, mm. that the miners, whether legal, whether with license or not with license, are not carrying through with their reclamation plans. That is why the environment is suffering. Mm -hmm. Because if they go and dig a place, and when they finish, they plant, they do what they are supposed to do, nobody would feel the effect. If they are supposed to use chemical or certain uh, um, um, nature. in nature and they are monitored and they use it you will not find our water bodies being discolored right. so nobody is implementing it for me that is all the up and down now whether or not the plan worked we are now seeing that the plan did not work at least to a large extent because we now see I've seen short pictures now of the water bodies still in a bad state I have seen the mid the, the, I think it was the president or the media collusion against Ghana uh -huh. say, coming out to say that the plan had failed uh -huh. or the fight did not succeed. So all the seeming victories were all firing. Just an attempt to make it look as if the plan has worked. When the attention of the media and civil society gone out, then those behind the scenes, like uh, uh, the, uh, um, he said, that the integrity of those who had been put in charge of the process uh -huh. is the most important thing. As a stand now, well, it's still out in the air. We have a video, we have an investigative piece showing that the people who were in charge may not have done what they were expected to do. So if their integrity is, 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 is in doubt, then all this plan was only an opportunity, or at the end of the day, that may not have been the intention, mm. but at the end of the day, became an opportunity for certain persons in certain public offices to line their pockets to the detriment of not over one, 2,000 members of his association, but their families, and the economies of scale in those situations, uh, sorry, in those communities. Mm. If you go to a mining community, it's not only the people doing the actual mining, and I'm not sure. saying illegal mining, because they didn't ban illegal mining. They banned small-scale mining. And for me, I was hoping your uh, association would have taken them to court, but they did not. Because if the law states that if you apply, Per the law, you are and you've been given a license. No what committee can say that we have decided to stop you. They should have taken them to court, but they did not. Yeah. They banned all forms of small scale mining. So they did not have money. Those who were bringing caterpillars to rent to these people lost their jobs. The women who, or the men who were selling food and all those, it was a whole economic shutdown. Yeah. 
just because of one thing. Mm. And now we have found out that people were actually doing it. And may he so rest in peace. The major who died because of these things. Yes, we are, we've named something, we've given a fan, blah, blah, blah. But what has he died for? Mm. For me, that is the question I keep asking myself. We were told that this man died fighting illegal mining. And after his death, we have still not seen anything. May he so rest in peace. But we have disappointed him. Mm. Mm. I think we should go back to the drawing board, as uh, Brigadier well, said. Mm. Contact whatever work had been done in terms of reports, research, and everything. Find a lasting solution. No knee-jerk reactions. Mm -hmm. the, know how we will prioritize the thing. Because like I said, if the law says that you must have a reclamation plan, that is what the emphasis should be on. Right. And then we can save the environment. Very well. We'll come back. We'll, we'll, we need to take a break. When we come back, Emmanuel, you, you have uh, your another round at the discussion. Um, we'll be looking at um, further different angles um, as we go along on the show. But Emmanuel raised issues about barriers that have been put in place, which is, according to him, hindering the work of the licensed um, um, small-scale mining companies. We'll be looking at that and many others. Indeed, we'll be looking at the roadmap, which among others included um, the setting up of 60 ad hoc district committees on illegal mining, the, the, the procurement of drones to help with the monitoring and certain um, software applications, Galam Stop, and all of that. How have all those gone in terms of our fight against Galam Say We'll be interrogating all these issues when we come back after this short break. See you shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana, we are still looking at the issue of Galamse and how far we've come in our fight against Galamse. I'll take a few messages and return to the panelists here. Uh, this one is coming in from Lausanne in Adenta. He says, good morning, TV3. Why are we surprised about the statement made by the senior minister? Uh, so sad we have to ensure some of these things, endure some of these things from our so-called leaders. Tahir Ibrahim says, the deportation of Aisha Hon to her home country due to unlawful mining is or was in the right direction. However, what has been done to those who were caught extorting monies from officers of the commission to enable them operate mining firms illegally in Anas's video. When when Ghana imports toothpick. Okay. Um, good morning, Abna. I believe the time has come for Ghanaians to confirm their suspicion about the hypocrisy and double standards of the government. What the senior minister said was not a slip of tongue, but the true reflection and manifestation of the agenda of the government to abuse the mandate of the Ghanaian electorate. That's Isaac Conlan in Tamale. Abna, good morning to you and your panel. Our leaders are making us very disappointed. Government at a point will say, we are building Ghana beyond aid. Foreigners come to commit an offense and we let them go because their country is helping us with $2 billion. I remember the operation, Operation Vanguard at a point said they were going to shoot and kill. And uh, if Scott's doing Galam say, if, uh, I'm not quite sure what this is, but Thanks for that, Bismarck and Sunyan. Uh, this one says, hmm, it's unfortunate if this is how the president is putting his presidency on the line in matters of Galamse. Uh, this one says, ha Abna, happy Easter to you and your panelists. I believe we are still being colonized through our <laughs> elected officials just for sand winning. Our own Ghanaian people were beaten and their tipper tracks burned to ashes up north. It says mental colonialism. So sad. Good morning. So because of Sinohydro, our government left a foreign Galamse criminal, Aisha, off. But for our own Ghanaians that are involved in Galamse because of poverty, they are jailed. What a government. That's Peter in Konongo. Um, this one says, Akufado must fire senior minister for exposing Ghana to mm -hmm. global ridicule. That's Charles Kwao Kaleji in Saboba. Um, it's so unfortunate that our indigenous small scale miners have been killed on the field, yet Aisha Huan was deported, all because of Sinohydro coming in with two billion to excavate our bauxite away. Will our problems be solved with this Sinohydro deal? Ghana is being impoverished more with this kind of statement from the senior minister. 
the government is rather aiding these Chinese to deplete our lands. That's from Yamoha in Wa. Uh, we'll take a break with our messages here. We'll get back to them as we go along. But let me return to the panelists here, and I, I, I'll go to you, um, Brigitte. Iman, I know, I know you wanted to make a submission. You can do that when, when I get to you, but quickly, um, let me go to Brigitte here. We're, we're looking at the roadmap before we, we, we left off, and um, we were told that the roadmap, the highlights of it included, you know, halting of operational activities of the large-scale mining companies that had flouted laid down regulations, then halting the activities of prospecting companies engaged in bulk sampling and processing, sensitization and educational tours of mining communities, some, the setting up of some 60 ad hoc district committees on illegal mining uh, who were to work together with the Interministerial Committee and other stakeholders, including the EPA, Minerals Commission, Water Commission, and many others. Then there was to be the use of drone technology among others, which was going to, you know, impact heavily on the monitoring activities. Would you say that all of these measures taken together um, have achieved a certain purpose or not? I think what we should be asking ourselves is that what has the roadmap achieved? Mm -hmm. And then if we do an assessment and realize that it hasn't achieved anything or it hasn't achieved much, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's assess what the situation is. One would have thought that for over 21 months that there was a blockade. I mean, we stopped the mining. would have thought that during that period would have been used for proper planning. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's necessary for us to have a stakeholders meeting, get people who are committed, people who are dedicated, people who are professional in these things, come up with a new maybe road map for, for, for illegal mining. And then again, there is the need for us to implement the law because what we've realized is that we are still using act, an act which was uh, promulgated in 2006, which is Act 703. But there's an act which was uh, promulgated in 2015, December 2015, Act 900 which actually gives out stiffer punishments. So, for example, all equipment that were seized within 60 days of conviction should have been distributed to government institutions for them to use it for other things, not burn them okay. out in the field. <laughs> so, so I think that we need to go back, look at it, see the plan, go back to the plan, and then make sure that we implement Act 900 of 2015. Mm -hmm. I think that will solve the problem. We should go but back to the drawing table. Going back to the drawing table. Mm. And let me just mention that uh, if you talk about drone technology, you see, uh, there should be an understanding of how the drone works. If the drone flies over an area with foliage, you will not see anything happening within the forest. And so, unless it is areas that are open. And the drone can be used for two purposes. You can monitor and stop it, or monitor and alert people that the vanguard people are coming, mm. in whichever way you want to use it. Mm. So I think that the important thing now is to go back to the drawing board. Let's do a frank assessment. And I want to just mention that we should be attacking the issues, attacking the problem. I don't think that we should talk about personalities. Mm. The plans that we have, how effective are they? Let's look at it and be honest with ourselves and go back and sit down and plan properly. And it doesn't matter where, which person is there. Let's make sure that we get professionals to come out with a comprehensive plan that will take care of the long term. Mm. Very well. Emmanuel, this 60 ad hoc um, districts, I, fi I find it quite interesting. If you could tell us, you, you are you know, on the ground, how their role in the fight, how were they to operate? You know, because uh, from, from, from governments, you know, the reports that we have is that they were to work together with, you know, the stakeholders, EPA, Minerals Commission and all of that. Now, you raised a very important point earlier on about how, you know, the existing um, state institutions, for instance, the Minerals Commission and all, are under-resourced and questioning why we should even, you know, begin to, as it were, reinvent the wheel and setting up parallel structures and all. Now, how do you see the work of the 60 ad hoc um, district committees? Have they made any impact? Are they working as they should be working or what? Do you know? Yeah, um, I don't have access to their report and what they've done so far, but the idea was to have the first frontliners in the communities. 
so that um, we will have um, a comprehensive committee that has representation of all the stakeholders. So the traditional leaders, the, the DC and its people, the security, minerals commission, yes. EPA, and then also a member from the association as well. Okay. And and so for me it was it was a good thing. Um, I mean it's something that can actually help if it is allowed to work as it should, then it's something that can work and it can help in addressing some so of So what these exactly challenges. will be their role? Yes, you said they are the first first line of contact as it were, but what exactly would that entail? Yeah. So basically what they are supposed to know is know all the mining activities that is going on in that particular district, know all the miners and how they operate, pay them from time to time, visit and know their boundaries and all those kind of stuff. Mm. In, the, in fact, it's one of the things that the association has been advocating for. So that at the end of the day, we should have what we call self-policing, where the association would have its own um, tax force and monitoring team. And then once we do things, then we, we kind of liaise with the committee with the DC as the chair or the MC as the chair to know really what is actually happening. Mm. So that if there's any illegal activity that is coming up, we can easily stop it right at the district level. Mm -hmm. Again, it will also be a platform for information sharing and all that implementation and the securities are also on it. So mm. uh, I, it's, it, it, it was a good thing and they were inaugurated um, way back, I think 2017 mm -hmm. or so in the, but uh, I'm not privy to their reports now, so right. I don't know what is what is happening mm. now on mm. that but i wanted to quickly sure. um correct a certain impression about the fact that both the licensed and the illegal miners left pits open i mean we went around the international committee on illegal mining on this and we discovered that over 90 percent of the licensed miners who had submitted their uh, concession documents in order to the committee had actually reclaimed their site mm -hmm. before the ban was uh, put in place um, and then 40 percent of our members were using mercury free methods to recover their gold these are facts that are there for people to know so the the idea that uh, we really didn't know how the licensed miners were operating or perhaps there was a thin line between illegal mining and then the licensed miners that idea is is wrong what we saw was that we saw an escalation of illegal mining which kind of swallowed the activities of the licensed ones, because of lack of um, 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 proper regulation and enforcement of our laws. And so once we're able to tackle it from that point of view, then the licensed miners can come out well for people to know what some of, yes, I'm not saying that all of them were. were so wouldn't really that right justify the, the, the ban across board then? Because if according to what you're saying, the illegal miners overshadowed, they were then the majority. Mm -hmm. So to be able to, you know, deal with the situation, then let's have that shut down, deal with it in a certain way, and then return to normalcy. Yes, you see, psychologically, um, that would rather cause more harm. Mm. Because at the end of the day, what is the incentive for me to license my operation? How would I know that um, next time when there is a government, the government would come and say that, look, because um, the state security didn't work, because of somebody's negligence, um, I'm going to be punished for it. Mm -hmm. So I don't have that incentive to go in for the lines again. Mm. And I can't even trust in that lines because once a government can place a ban on it, any other government can also do the same mm. with any excuse whatsoever. All the government will need to put together some media work mm. and then flash it on our screens for people to know that, hey, this thing is really happening. Mm. And then, bam, there's a ban on us. Mm. I mean, that was not a way to go. Seriously, um, if you really want to formalize the sector, formalization doesn't happen in a day or it's not a one-stop product. It is a process. And so in order for us to be able to achieve that process, um, we should be able to understand how or where we came from. I mean, the, the law for small scale mining promulgated in 1989, the first one, this year will be 30 years. And then from there, we had the 2006 ones, Act 703, okay. and then the subsequent amendments and all that. We have, we have come a long way. And I thought that um, if we were to make progress, would have rather first, um, like I said, resource the regulatory agencies to be able to do their monitoring effectively. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we, we also help the association to organize well, mm -hmm. or perhaps support them to do their self-regulation, which is part of formalization. Right. And then again, um, when regimes change, because uh, formalization deals with regimes, so it changes. When it changes, then we find a way of educating and sensitizing people to fall in line. Mm. 
this is the only way we can resolve this issue. Vanguard here, Vanguard there, ban them. It will not help <laughs> anybody. Rather, it's going to deplete our scarce resources sure. already that the state has. Sure. And uh, um, at the end of the day, what we see is um, a few greedy people will pack their pockets. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I want, ones will be right, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll still on you, and given that you are on the ground and doing it, I just want to ask about this software they talked about, the Galam Stop, yeah. to help. Do you know how that has worked? Yeah, I know that they are piloting that software. Mm -hmm. In fact, that software is, is a good thing uh, because if not for anything, it will have data of small-scale miners across the country. Mm -hmm. Um, that data in it will have the boundaries of small-scale mining operations as well, of which you can use satellite technology to check the boundaries and check the progress of work mm. and all that. And then again, it will have details of the directorship of a particular small-scale mine and the activities in there. The data is good for one policy to for monitoring exactly. as well. So for me, it is good. And the association itself, we embarked on a project to develop uh, such a system like that. We call it optimum RM, mm. and so uh, using technology for that, it's it's, it's a wonderful idea mm. and something that that's what what matters is the implementation so. actually. Because yeah. if you're gathering that all the data and you're not using it, it exactly. in a certain way, then exactly. what what's the point? Um, uh, Bobby, Emmanuel earlier on raised issues about the fact that yes, with uh, after the ban was lifted, a number of barriers have been put in place, you know, and it's hindering the work. I just want us to look at it uh, like this that. Yes, we seem to have had, or we seem to have a situation on our hands. Now we are trying to deal with it. Um, these entities may have complied with the law as it is, you know, they have their licenses and everything. Mm -hmm. Now these new things coming in as barriers, they may be new to them. How lawful would that be in terms of, you know, operating a system that already is in mm -hmm. place? Mm -hmm. Now you've brought in these things which he's considering to be hindrances mm -hmm. to the operations mm -hmm. of the, the, the companies or the entities as currently mm. constituted by the law? Mm. Well, I'm not sure if regulations have been passed. Mm -hmm. They have a right, the minister has a right to always get an ally right. to be passed to make some of these policies into law. I'm not sure if they have. Um, I have always um, advised some of your members who have asked me that, listen, some of these things they tell you, they are very careful to put them in writing, mm -hmm. if you've noticed. If you apply and you go asking them why has it not been done, they tell you, oh, wait, we are waiting for instructions, or we are waiting for this, or the, they now said you need to do this. They hardly write in response to your application that we will not give it to you because you do not have tracking devices, for example, on your caterpillar. If they do that and there is no regulation supporting it, then you would have a basis to go and challenge that decision. And then it will be whether or not it is law or it mm -hmm. is policy, whether it's enforceable. Then we'll see what the court will come out of it. But now we all seem to think, or well, we've been made to believe, that the, the government is taking steps to preserve the environment. Right. It's a crisis situation, mm -hmm. as they presented it. And as a crisis, we need their powers to make sure the situation is salvaged. And so they had a lot of public support. Because we, we thought that it would, I'm using my words carefully, I'm not condemning their effort, not at all. But I, I, I have stated that I think they did not go about it in the best way. I'm not an expert though. <laughs> and, but we've seen the end results. We are still back to almost square one. If some of these hurdles that you are putting in your way are things that practically will not work, then it means that you are, you are, you are eliminating by rough tactics, as we call in our Balance. Mm. So if you are making it more expensive to do the work, so somebody will pay so much for a license, pay so much to EPA, pay so much for digging fee, and even the buying, getting the land itself, pay so much for that, and at the end of the day, he will be told that you must pay 2,900 CDs as a tracking device mm. for each caterpillar. Assuming you are using four or three, then you have to pay all of these for them to come and inspect. It puts extra burdens, right. and there will be people who may not be able to afford it. So even though they have satisfied all the legal requirements, then by virtue of policy issues, they've been deprived of their rights right. to work. And these are matters that could be challenged. But like I said, I don't know whether regulations have been passed. 
by the minister or mm. the ministry mm. to give legal backing to some of these requirements. If they have done that, then fair enough. If they have not done that, then I'm sure that those who've been affected would have ways and means of trying to question the appropriateness or the legality of some of these requirements. Right. And it will be interesting to test. Exactly. It will be, it will be interesting it. because yeah. in our bid to ensure that there's sanity within the sector, we also need to comply mm, with, mm, with the, the law. Exactly. Yeah. Because I, I think it's the non-compliance which has led us to where we are. So and we, we don't want to... Exactly. <laughs> we seem to be... Wrongs, do not make exactly. <laughs> we have, I'm, I'm told we have just about seven minutes to wrap up on the show. So I'll come to you, um, Brigadier. Uh, for your concluding remarks um, in respect of this issue, how we move on and, you know, looking back, any experiences to share? Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that uh, the situation as it is now, we all agree that uh, there are challenges. It uh, depends upon how the angle you look at it. But I personally feel that uh, all the measures that have been put in place haven't worked. Mm. And I think that we should go back, look at all efforts that have been put in the past, see what we can do to come up with comprehensive plans, short, medium, and long term. We should look at the laws again, make sure that Act 900 of 2015 is actually being implemented. That would be a serious determinant because once one person knows that I go, I have equipment, and I'm convicted and it's confiscated to the state, I think that it will go a long way to help us. Mm. Finally, I think that we need people of integrity who will coordinate all that is happening. People who are professional and people that we can trust. And I think that posterity will not forgive us if we are not able to do anything about the situation as it is now. Mm. This is what I would like to, to talk about. Very well, thanks. Emmanuel, uh, your concluding remarks, but also to speak to the issue about self-regulation, because you, you mentioned that, and I found that interesting. I would want to know exactly how you, the, the association does that or intends to you know, do okay. that. Okay, all right. So basically, um, what I would say that it is important that we formalize the sector and, and eliminate the illegalities mm -hmm. of it. It's very important. And in the context of self-regulation, it's, it's all boils down to the formalization process. You know, formalization um, basically has three stages according to how uh, we, we have conceptualized as an association. You know, you have the, the legal parts where regulations and other things take predominance, and then we have the licensing processing, like the process someone has to go through, have to go through and all that. And we have the organization bit where the front of the miners is organized, like the Association of Small Scale mm. Miners, and then also the, the site or the operations of the miner is organized as well. So once we are able to go through all the steps, and thankfully, Ghana, we have enough laws for mining. Hmm. The laws are perfect and wonderful. And so that part is solved. And then when it comes to organization, yes, we have the Ghana National Association of Small Scale Miners. And then, so the bit that um, perhaps we are missing is organizing the individual entities. That is where self-policing um, self, um, or self-regulation comes in. So in this case, um, the association as a bigger body would have uh, what we call our tax forces in all the mining districts and then monitoring teams as well. What the tax force will be doing is one, to prevent illegalities going on, and then the monitoring, monitoring teams will go in there and see the shortfalls in compliance and then advise and train people to be able to comply with the situation. I'm just thinking order. this would require lots of resources. Are you that well resourced? <laughs> Yes, I mean, uh, basically, if, if we are supported, we should be able to do this. And we, will not, we definitely don't need 50 million. <laughs> we need way lesser than that mm. amount of money to be able to implement this. And this will go a long way to help the industry mm. and help us um, fight this kind of illegal mining. Mm. And rather bringing locals to also partake in our natural resource exploitation, which is important. We right. need to do this. Right, sure. Thank you for that. Bobby, your concluding remarks. Um, we all need our environment mm -hmm. safe, sound, secure. It doesn't mean that people must be deprived of their livelihood. We must find a, a, a ground to compromise not the values of our society, but to make sure that whatever policies, laws, regulations are being drafted or being put in place with Ghana in mind. Mm. 
not politicians, not individuals, not to enrich people's pockets. We have laws, like Dr. General said, that have been passed almost 30 years now. If there is a need to change some of the provisions to suit it with modern trends, nobody is against it. Mm. But in doing that, we must not victimize people mm. who, has, who have set out to earn a livelihood legally. And we must not let people who have set out to do the wrong things go on the basis of their nationality. Other than that, the independence that Kwame Nkrumah, and if I may add, JB Dankwa, <laughs> uh, helped Ghana attain would be in vain. Don't start okay. this debate yet. Yeah. I may mean, have to add before. <laughs> Don't start this debate. I'm quoted as saying Kwame Nkrumah is the only person. <laughs> Don't start this debate. <laughs> Since our history is being changed in the curriculum. <laughs> Anyways, well, so the conversation about uh, a fight against anti, um, sorry, um, Galamse continues and we will keep an eye on that space, how well we're doing there to ensure that our dream of ensuring that our environment is kept safe for ourselves today and future generations yet to be born is duly upheld. On that note, we bring um, this face of the show to an end. We'd like to say thank you to Brigadier General Daniel Mishu, former chairman of the National Security Committee on Lands and Natural Resources, Mr. Emmanuel Yuenchi Enchi. He is the director of operations, Ghana Small Scale Mining uh, Miners Association, and Bobby Banson, a private legal practitioner. We'll take a break. When we come back, we turn to the floods in Accra next. See you shortly. Come back here still watching and listening to The Key Point. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So next we're going to be looking at um, the perennial flooding situation in the country. We'll be looking um, at Accra, but also um, within the perspective of the entire countries and the problem spots in the country to help us have that conversation we have in the studio from my extreme left we have engineer ben arthur he's a civil engineer and a labor and adr practitioner next to him is engineer weiss amitope he is the registrar for the engineering council and to my right is dr kamin bezier he is a lecturer with the department of planning at the kwame Nkrumah university of science and technology good morning gentlemen good morning, good morning. welcome to the show it's good to have you here um, so we'll be looking at the flooding situation in the country, which has become uh, an issue that we need to grapple with every, every year. Um, uh, I don't think the rainy season is in yet, but we've had a series of some um, downpours which have caused a uh, lot of troubles. We've had, you know, precious lives lost properties damaged and many other worrying um, incidents and we'll be looking at why it seems we um, are still grappling with this issue because for as long as I can remember flooding has been an issue in Accra and gradually it's going into other areas of the country. Um, I'll start with you Engineer Weiss Amitape here. Um, what seems to be the problem? Thank you. Um, Accra floods. Uh, I think we've been experiencing flood year in, year out. The major problems, I can group them in five. One is the drainage of the flood. Another is the flood management itself. Mm. Uh, another one is the way we handle our sanitation and solid waste. Mm -hmm. Then uh, the other one is the informal settlement, the way people settle in flood-prone areas. Right. And then uh, the last one, uh, which is the fragments of institutional arrangements. This is the, uh, these are some of the categories into which we can put in the, the causes of the flood. Mm. When we go ahead, we can ex uh, expand these uh, items. Very well. So when you talk about fragmentation in institutional arrangements what, mm. what what is that because i think the drainage flood management sanitation and so on, those are quite you know yeah. um, um, um e understandable but fragmentation in institutions what is it is it a lack of coordination yeah or what? which goes to be the lack of coordination we have different agencies dealing with flood for example we have water and sanitation dealing with flood ministry dealing with flood management 
We have Minister of Works and Housing dealing with flood management. We have Minister of Rules sometimes uh, dealing with flood management in terms of their road uh, covered and so on. And so if there is no coordination, then there seems to be uh, design problems which can cause flooding or mm -hmm. can lead to flooding issues. So from what you're saying, then it means the coordination should start right from the design of the roads yeah. to the construction of it and then even the maintenance. Then. Yes. If you are uh, one in agency mm -hmm. identifies its uh, sources of funding and it wants to undergo any drainage uh, development, then it means all these institutions should be involved mm. that, to know what do you have on, I mean, what stake do you have what stake do you have? I'll just give you one example sure. before we go ahead. At the, look at the uh, Kwame Nkrumah interchange. Mm -hmm. At the time, the urban, I mean, the Rose Agency wanted to undertake the flyover construction. There needs to be a coordination between the hydrological service, or the, for, for that matter, the Minister of Western Housing. Yes, there is a drainage issue in that area, which is the NEMA, which has been responsible for causing a lot of flooding. Sure. But that was not uh, really done. They went ahead, did a flyover, beautiful, everything. So they were dealing with the traffic management aspect. They were successful with this. Mm -hmm. But then the drainage component, which should at least make the project fully uh, complete, was lacking. And it means we will still be experiencing flooding, even though the cycle has been completed, we will still be experiencing flooding. But if the two had come together, we have this amount, bring this amount so that we make the project complete, we would have at least solved that component because the road agency was not having the resources to take up that of the drainage issues. Mm. Yeah. I'm just wondering how that kind of coordination would be lacking given the, you know, the, 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 the history we have in respect of that particular area. Mm -hmm. And so if such a project is being undertaken, you would expect that the needed consultations and whatever it is that should go with it would have happened. So if that doesn't happen, it's quite... Um, That's why a, I, listed it, I mm -hmm. uh, listed it as one of oh, the yeah. causes of, of our uh, flooding issues. Mm -hmm. I, I try to itemize mm. the causes of flooding. Mm -hmm. And so I've given you these five major right. yeah, areas. Mm -hmm. yeah. which, which is, which is le leading to the yeah. situation we find ourselves in. Now, mm -hmm. um, Engineer Ben, Quickly, now that Kwame Nkrumah area, um, uh, the interchange has come up, I want us to dwell on that. Because mm -hmm. in recent times, we've had, um, uh, you know, some rains come in. I think three consecutive Sundays, we've had rains, and it's all resulted in some flooding in one area or the other. The Kwame Nkrumah um, interchange area has been one of the, you know, uh, major, major sites of such flooding. And the situation with the Kwame Nkrumah interchange area is not new. We had it, as I remember. We had, you know, this construction there. And like Engineer Wise, I'm mean, said, perhaps it dealt with the traffic management issues. But a major issue there with was flooding has not been dealt with, looking at what has happened recently. What is it about that area? Is it the nature of the area that is leading to others causing this or what yes institutional issues may be there but there may be a fundamental you know underlying issue to that effect well, thank you for the opportunity but permit me to greet our viewers as well as my my colleagues in Mampong. Mm. maybe in the course of the submissions i will get an opportunity to see some flood spots in my district as well but coming back to the Kwame Nkrumah interchange, mm -hmm. which is not an isolated case, sure. uh, let me speak about it together with that of Tatekwashi, when you get to the African Ranger uh, Hotel, mm -hmm. and then Malam Junction, and then the Obechevilamte Circle. Usually when you construct roads, they serve as dams, depending on the direction of uh, the flow of water. I'm just trying to use simple language sure. because of those listening to us or watching us. They serve as dams. So what it means is that you need to create enough avenue under it, usually, for good passage of water. Now, if you look at the Kwame Nkrumah interchange issue, number one, the drainage facilities provided are not 
adequate for the passage of water, and that's why we have the flooding. But going back upstream, there are one or two things that we must know. Like other places in Accra, when we have some of these situations, number one, we must appreciate that the upstream characteristics you know, has changed. We have rapid urbanization. And if you look at the Odor River, if you look at other contributing water to that area, you realize that many years back when the channels were designed, we had a lot of vegetative cover outside Accra. Mm. But now we have removed a lot of the vegetative covers, a rapid urbanization, settlements here and there. So when we have a particle of water that drops, for example, at, say, uh, two kilometers away. Many years back, it used to travel here slowly, but now it travels Quickly. very, very fast because of the pavement and the vegetative cover removal and the rest. But we have not redesigned those channels. When I say channels, the drainage size mm. to accommodate that. We also have issues with siltation. Apart from people throwing rubbish and the rest, over the, the months of rain, drains, and those, we have, you know, uh, soil that clogs and reduces the channel sizes. So if over the years nobody has access to some of the areas to the salt, which is usually the case, in those channels, you realize that we don't have enough opening for people to access it and desalt it. So once we are not doing that, you must know that the capacity has reduced. So let me let me put you that so, yes, yeah. so that we deal with the two things you've talked about so far: inadequate drainage systems, yeah. um, and then the siltation issue, and the fact that we don't have you know easy access, as it were, to these drainage to do yeah, the it, desilting. I'm just thinking. I mean, when such constructions are going on, there are professionals involved. I would want to believe there are professionals involved in all of that. So is it that advice is given, but not taken or that they uh, are not even consulted in the first place well engineers do it but you must know that aside engineering implementation there's something we call monitoring and evaluation yeah, but if you want to have access to it and by reason of how it's constructed you can't have access then it's a pr fundamental issue of what went into the design oh definitely that that is one yes but as whether people get in there to do the more or less schedule maintenance <laughs> is it in Ghana it's another thing. after we have done uh, we, we've put in the infrastructure and it's working. We virtually forget about maintenance. So if you people don't get in there to maintain the place, we end up having, you know, some of these situations. But one key other that we need to remember that where the water is coming from has had changed, you know, characteristics, and we must not dissociate it from mm. the local issues that we're having. So uh, if you are mentioning all the troubles that we have, don't live where we are having the water from. It is also a cost. You know, once we are not putting in other bricks in those areas, we must know. Let me give you a typical example. Many years ago, Alajo mm. area used to flood at the least right. you know, rain. When I say least rain, maybe four millimeter, you know, height of uh, mm. sorry, four millimeter intensity. You know, over an hour or two, we realized that they will be experiencing flooding. At the least opportunity of rain, there will be flooding. But when the, the, the place was streamlined, the channels were open, and we had you know concrete line drainage facility, it never occurred unless we have had beyond what it had been estimated for. So these are some of the things we must do. Back to Malam Junction. In fact, I happened to be part of the team that designed, uh, that did the review of the design because the the. CPC, uh, which was a, a Japanese company, had done the design. I was then with Consortium. So I was part of the team that did the design review from Malam Junction to Yamransa. And the kind of drainage structures that were put in there during the construction phase, I thought that, you know, not all was constructed. And then if you also look at some structures that impeded the construction, which in my opinion, we, had been, we should have been bold enough to demolish those structures and diverted a lot of the water, which we couldn't do, you know, because you are not dealing with engineering. You are dealing with city authorities. You are dealing with all manner of Town institutions. Once enough. it was not done, we knew that any time we had rain beyond certain levels, because it was serving as a dam, 
or more or less as a collection point just beneath Makati Hill. It was going to serve as a bowl, collect the water, run it all the way down to the Mala market. And at the end of the day, that is the, the issue. We must also not forget that some of these channels have clogged because we have people all the way from Karendorf, Dansuman area, other areas encroaching. They are constantly reclaiming the land, which is made for uh, more or less the collection of water and its safe passage to the, the sea. So once we are changing the characteristics, which, which enhances free flow of water, we must expect flood. Mm. No. We must expect. Now you said yes. that the, the, the plan for the Malamin to change, the drainages and the drainage that was put in there, you don't think it was done in accordance with the plan? But you know, it was not adequate. It wasn't. Well, me, so was again, maybe let me just yes. that particular mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. The Malam area initially had uh, an inadequate uh, channel capacity. Right. Now the situation has changed. In fact, they have designed yeah, a, a, new a bit channel. improved. It's changed mm -hmm. considerably. They have designed a new channel. New it's been constructed. So if you see the recent floods that have come, nothing has occurred at mm -hmm. Malam Junction. Mm -hmm. The situation is now under control under Malam Junction. But you cannot design any channel to be 100% flood proof. Sure, so but to the extent that... To the extent that you have the minimum rainfall causing flooding at Malam Junction, that is eradicated. That, that, that's when I get that, um, Engineer Mr. Pei. But to mm. the extent that there's a design mm. that you should construct the road to meet, that, you know, in compliance with that design, but we don't do that, that raises an issue, number one. No, that one, unless... Every road structure should have, I mean, has uh, hydraulic structure, that is the drains mm -hmm. across it or the mm -hmm. culverts across mm -hmm. it. These culverts must be designed to be able to accommodate rain, water, the flood the, or flow that comes from upstream. So if it is not done, mm -hmm. then there is a problem. Mm -hmm. Those issues, that's what I referred to as drainage initially. Right. Yeah. So every structure passing or crossing a road which is to convey flow, must be designed to a certain capacity. And we have standards that we practice in Ghana. For example, we design culverts yeah. to take one in 50 years flood, a flood type that will take a flow once, I mean, a flow type that will occur once in 100, I mean, 50, 50 years. Once in 50 yeah. years. And our drainage structures in the cities, we design them to take a flood type that will occur once in 25 years. These are the standards we adopt, mm. which agree with other international standards um, uh, uh, in, in international standards that mm -hmm. are being practiced. Mm -hmm. So we are doing the same. But then here, some areas, people go in to build mm -hmm. these facilities without any design, without any uh, enforcement to make sure that they are done according to specification. That's where the problem comes in. Right, mm -hmm. right. Now I'll come to you here, um, Dr. Kaminta. You've heard your <laughs> co-panelists speak, the issues um, about, you know, flood management issues, lack of institutional coordination, and, of course, uh, poor enforcement of laws or regulations regarding, you know, um, planning issues and all of that. You are coming from the Department of, <laughs> is it planning? Yes. Right, at the K K K N U S T. Um, what What do you make of these challenges that we have and we seem not to be able to be dealing with them effectively. I mean, I, I, I used to think that, you know, an area like Tema was, I, I, off, off, off camera, I was telling you that Tema used to be the, uh, the, 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 the poster city, if you like, of, you know, well-planned and all of that. But now they are also experiencing their fair share of of floods and all these things that come with, you know, poor um, um, planning of, of cities and towns. Thank you very much, Abna. Um, the first thing I would like to do is to take this opportunity to express my condolences to the bereaved families mm. of sure. those who lost their lives right. uh, in the last flood. Sure. Understand they're a military couple. Mm. Um, there was also a medical doctor around the demo bridge in Teshi mm -hmm. and various others who lost their lives. Mm -hmm. my, my heartfelt condolences to their families. Sure. Um, I've listened to my colleagues and um, obviously from my background, the first thing is 
planning. Yep. Um, I remember when I relocated to this, uh, back to Ghana in 2009, I met a senior government official and I asked him why we still have open drains in, the, in Accra in particular. And the first answer I got was that, oh, Accra is uh, a low-lying area and so it will be difficult to have covered drains. I was shocked because uh -huh. Holland is 22 feet below sea level. They have managed to control floods in that country. In fact, the highest point in Holland is uh, uh, about 3,000 feet and slopes all the way to below 22 feet, uh, 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 22 feet below sea level. So I have looked at all of these things and I have identified five key areas that if we need a long lasting solution, we should be looking at them very well. The first one is that we need a drainage master plan. Mm. And it's not because we haven't had it before. Um, we've had drainage master plan from the days of Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, through Buzia to recent administrations. The question is, have we actually implemented those master plans. I hear there is uh, one that is currently being updated. Now, is it going to be updated and then just put on the shelf like the previous ones, or we are going to implement? Now, I'll give you some figures to um, see. Once we, we have a drainage master plan, we, we may not have the money to develop it all at a go. And even if we did, it will take a number of years to get it together. Mm -hmm. But then once you have it and you know the cost to it, you can incrementally develop it. And I'll tell you, when the, the last uh, uh, floods happened, um, I understand that 197 million had been given to the, the is it Ministry of Works, Works, and, Works and Housing for the Sultan. Now, Every year, mm -hmm. there is money for the Sultan. Mm -hmm. Now, if we had a drainage master plan, been 20 years back, and we're having even 100 million a year towards the, the, the master plan, we would have gone a long way by now. The second problem is we need development control. We plan the cities, and we identify areas that we, we need to do drains, not build there, people go and they start building on those areas. Now, development control has to be effective to the extent that if that happens, they tell you, you are not supposed to build here, you build there, they pull it down mm -hmm. before the person even goes up. But building permits, uh, enforcement of uh, town and country planning at was uh, rules and regulations are almost not existent. So it's one of the areas, development control, that we have to look at very, very well. Now, one other thing, my colleague in Dam, I want to give broader meaning to the term. Now, there is something we call rainwater harvesting. Now, a lot of times when people hear rainwater harvesting, they think about uh, buildings, the roof, collecting mm -hmm. water from there. But my colleagues here will tell you that in the broader sense, when you have a waterway, because of the issues of flooding, if we incorporate it into development control, we build areas along the waterway called dams or receiving areas. Mm. So when the water rushes, it goes there, there is a big dam, a pond, it collects the water. And so until it's full, it cannot be released to continue on its course. So it slows it down. Sometimes, even if it doesn't get full, what happens is that it stays there and it sinks, and that water can be used for other purposes like agriculture right. and even greenery within the, the cityscape. So that is one thing that we, ha we also have to start looking at effectively so that these waters can be controlled. Now, the fourth thing is flood control and management itself. Now, if, again, you go to developed countries, they have what they call floodgates mm -hmm. along uh, water courses, drainage courses, 
where they pass through. So if there is a, an issue there, they have barriers that, in, that are engineered and constructed so that when the water is coming, these barriers hold the water there for a bit and then they actually open it and control the flow that goes out. So you can actually control and manage the flood that way. But these are all engineering issues mm -hmm. that uh, we need to look at seriously so that we can control some of these things. And like I said, it's not a silver bullet. It's not something that you can just do tomorrow. It's something that we have to plan and do it over a period of time. Lastly, uh, point five, project coordination and management. Uh, my two colleagues have been talking about fragmented agencies and all right. that. Um, I remember in 2013, it was, uh, we went to Sakaman. There was flooding over there. Mm -hmm. And what had happened was that Department of Urban Roads had constructed uh, a drainage facility there. Now, they didn't consult anybody. They went with their own specifications, constructed a drain, costing a lot of money to the state. Then when the floods happened, Hydrological Services Department went in there and realized that the specifications were not up to standards. Were not up to standards. And so they had to break mm. work that had already been done, use designs that were uh, sufficient to control the amount of water that comes in there, and then reconstructed it, all at the cost of the taxpayer. I'm just thinking what happened to the officers, officials who, you know, supervised that construction. Oh, well, no sanctions. Because exa uh, oh, exactly. Oh, nothing happened. And that is why yes. we find ourselves in th th this kind of situation. So the, the thing is, uh, uh, highways agents, uh, highways authority, urban roads, feeder roads, if you must do any road anywhere, you first of all have to consult hydrological services department. Right on the specifications for your drainage. If they don't do it, you, they shouldn't be allowed to construct any of those facilities. Right. And I think if we're able to do some of these things, yeah. uh, we'll be on our way to solving the right. flooding problem in Accra and other parts of the country. Right, sure. So a number of uh, possible you know, solutions to the issues coming up um, here. We will be looking at these issues into some detail, but we need to take a break when we come back. We will return to the panelists and we will conclude or we will um, carry on with the conversations about the flooding situation in the country and why it seems we are grappling with this very issue. See you shortly. Welcome back. If you're still watching and listening to The Key Points on TV3, we're also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana, we're looking at the flooding situation in the country, uh, which seems to be occurring year in, year out, causing loss of lives, damage to properties, and many other um, worrying situations. We're trying to understand exactly what the problem is, what can be done about it, as well as the way forward. Now, we have the uh, mayor of Accra on the line, uh, in the person of Mr. Mohamed DJ Soa. We'll go to him briefly for his perspectives and what the um, uh, authority is doing about the situation. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Very well. Thank you. And thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Great. So, Mayor, we're looking at the situation about our floodings. And in recent times, or about the past three Sundays, consecutive Sundays, we've had some rainfall. And, of course, the impact has been very, very disturbing. We've had loss of lives. Um, I believe the number is about 12 or more. And loss, I mean, damaged damage to property and all we are talking to the experts in the studio they're talking about you know the the, the long-term solutions and all but we just want to understand from you um, looking at the situation what is the authority doing to prevent you know further damage and further debts as the rainy season is even yet to take off thank you very much for having me uh, first of all let me say that uh, 
uh, uh, happy Easter to you and to your uh, to your guests and then your viewers as well. Mm -hmm. uh, let me also apologize for my inability to uh, be on the show this morning. Okay. But, uh, I had an emergency, that's why. Mm. Thank you very much once again. Uh, this is a very important subject uh, that uh, we continue to talk about. Um, as you all know, um, a crowd flooding had been with us for ages, and there's a need for us to uh, uh, continue with the short-term measures, as well as um, having a long-term plan towards it. On long elude ads. Uh, when the Ex Excellency, the President, uh, declared his intention to make a crowd certainly uh, a long-term plan is required so that after its exit, we will have a very clean agenda. I must say that uh, the issue of sanitation is also a cause of the flooding in Accra. Mm -hmm. uh, but the infrastructure deficit that we have, it's a major concern, and that must be tackled so that we can, min we can minimize the impact of flooding that we got in Accra. Uh, all our major storm drains in Accra uh, are, in, are in bad shape. Some have not even had any concrete or whatsoever, and, and some are filled with also silt. But the question is that what are we also doing in mm -hmm. government and as a city authority to address these challenges that we are confronted with? Um, the Udo Khalid Lagoon is the final uh, or intermediate repository of the water before it gets into the sea. And you could see that uh, it's been it's been choked with a lot of silt as well as uh, garbage. So um, um, we started the uh, the Ministry of Works and Housing has commenced the, the, the dredging of the Kole Lagoon for the past uh, two weeks, and, and it's ongoing. You, when you go there, you see the machines there. It's also important also to state that uh, uh, construction of the storm drains in Accra has also commenced. Unfortunately, this is not a kind of off-the-shelf uh, purchase or activity, it takes a bit of time. So once construction has started, it will take a bit of time before it, com before it concludes. And the, the Fadaman uh, drain and South to Dock, all these storm drains are going, to, are going to be redone this year, and some have already commenced. Uh, I've been on the fort for about two weeks, and I, I can tell you for that. Uh, including the Sukura drain that is going to, to be uh, uh, constructed. I, I mean, there's a tall list of, of it. Then, as well, we we have we have a concern also about people who who are not safety conscious, and that is very important for us to also. Talk about. Mr. Mayor, uh, before we go, house. before we go, sorry to cut you. Before we go into the issues about the attitudes of um, of, of the citizenry, let's let's stay on um, your plans regarding the drainage um, system and you know the desilting okay. and all of that. You you talked about yeah. the fact that yes, work is ongoing um, in respect of the Odo um, uh, um, River and all of that. Question is, how is there a time scale we are looking at? I'm asking this because. Um, we are barely two months away from the rainy season. And looking at the situation now, we are not even in the rainy season yet, and we've seen the impact of the rain. So if we get into the rainy season, we can only expect that it's going to be even worse. And so how well prepared are we looking well, ahead of, I mean, the of, of that? The preparation is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that 
the the storm drains, the Kole Lagoon and the must be must be must be dredged, and that's what exactly we are doing, so that we can allow free flow of water in case it rains. So that's 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 very important. And the distilling thing also of major drains are ongoing. I can tell you that next week there are more that will also be be done because timing is very important. You know that we have open drains, and any time it uh, uh, it rains, or even before it rains, uh, silt gets into into the waterway. So when you you desilt it much more earlier, you can still find salt again back into it, and that could be more problematic, or you may have also uh, done work. However, uh, the timing is not proper. So timing is very, very important. Let me say that uh, one thing that we also uh, don't pay attention is the change in the climatic conditions mm -hmm. globally. And that is something we need to pay attention to. You are saying that the rainy season has not started. But you may be using a very old and archaic type table. The rainy season has also started in Accra because climatic conditions have changed. Rains, the rain starts a bit earlier than some years back. It rains more heavy within a very short period instead of raining and over a long period. And this is what is also causing a lot of problems globally, not only in Accra, Ghana. Globally, just yes, yes, I was watching TV. You know, it have been in one of the one of the states in the U.S. Two people have also passed on last week. The same thing happened. Two people had also passed on in the United States of America. One community called Franklin, and the list continues. But Mr. Mayor, uh, isn't isn't this isn't this perhaps? I mean, in view of your acknowledgement of the change in climatic conditions. Isn't this um, perhaps a reason why we probably should have started with the dredging and desilting much earlier? Exactly the point I'm trying to say. I'm not going to mix the issues. I'm just trying to indicate to you the fact that we have started the dredging, the, the Kole Lagoon. We have also uh, started the construction of the uh, of storm drains in Accra. However, Two rainy, major rainy season in the, in the country, in Accra, or in the country as a whole. So uh, it will take a bit of time. But the point is that I think that what we have started would be tackling the fundamental issues, especially the construction of the storm drains in Accra. This is very, very important because over the years, because of the deficiency in the storm drains that we have. Some have caved in, some we don't have anything at all. That will largely help us to mitigate the effects of the rains when, when it comes. Mm. So I will appeal for a reasonable time for us because we are doing the right thing we started. You could interpret it that it could be a bit late this year, but the fact of the matter is that construction takes a bit of time. And that's what we are doing. Very well. You are going to touch on the issues about um, uh, citizens and their attitudes. Quick touch on the highly, because I had, uh, you know, I've been around and I've seen few areas where the the rain has caused some ha havoc, mm -hmm. especially people dying. People, all the areas, it is largely because. When it is raining, instead of people staying away, they like to brace the situation and they try to drive through or walk through the rain. You can't fight water. And I think that it's important for us to educate our people that when it is raining, don't go around or don't, don't be too close to the waterway or don't drive through the water. The last three weeks when it rained, I was somewhere, and I could see a lot of people, small cars, trying to drive through the water, even on the Kanda, Kaukudi, which is just a small stretch. And to the extent that they moved from their lane and then have 
comes to the other lane because that other lane it is a bit better. Mm -hmm. And then you can collide with an even oncoming car. So I think that uh, we need to step up our education and I appreciate this platform that you have also given to us that people should stop driving through when it is raining at certain locations. When you see water ahead of you, please stop. The rain will fall for a couple of minutes and, and then we'll go. Clearly, I will urge that what we are doing today is for all of us. And as you continue to throw your refuse into the drains, as you continue to fill the drains with salt, we, we, we may continue to have flooding. And I think that we should stop these things. Once we are stepping up, just about two weeks, and for the past two weeks, we've prosecuted a lot of people. A lot of people, even mm. this year alone, we prosecuted close to 200 people on sanitation-related offenses. That's for this first uh, uh, first quarter of mm. the year. Allah and then uh, Abeka uh, sanitation courts. So we continue to prosecute people who who who, who does the wrong thing. However, it, it is also our responsibility as citizens also to stop these things. So yeah. we should continue to talk about it, but I will urge as, as citizens of this nation also to act more responsibly, because when disaster falls, it fall, it, you don't know where it will, it will fall. And very well. it could be you, it could be somebody, somebody else. I Listen. thank you very much mm. for this opportunity once again. And I wish you a good Easter. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. That's Mr. Mohammed Ajay Soa. He's the mayor of Accra. Uh, we spoke to him there in respect of what the authority is doing about the flooding situations. He talks about the drainage and um, uh, the desilting that is going on. Sorry, the desilting and, and, and the dredging that's going on in our drainages in the city. We will take a break. When we come back, we return to wrap on the conversations. Yes, yeah, see you shortly. Welcome back. This is a key point. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and around the world at 3news.com. Also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're looking at the flooding situations in the country and how best to deal with it. What are the causes, first of all, and how well um, organized are we to address them? We're in the studios here with um, Engineer Ben Arthur, Engineer Waisa Mitepe, and Dr. Kaminta Bezier trying to figure things out. I'll come to you now, Engineer Waisa Mitepe. Um, we've been looking at the long term measures. We spoke to the um, mayor of Accra trying to get uh, a sense of what happens in the interim how do we deal with the situation and he talks about the dredging the silting ongoing and all of that he mentioned one point which has to do with the climatic conditions changing and all of that due, due to global warming and all <laughs> then the i mean question about how well you know prepared are we in that regard how proactive are we in that regard because obviously the long-term solutions won't happen now but we do need to protect the citizenry as well your perspectives on what he said yeah, I think uh, what he said is quite okay, uh, but what I think uh, should be added is that uh, once we have changes, climatic changes, we, have, we all know that climate change has come, that should make us to begin preparation for the short-term measures, especially with the uh, removal of silt from channels, with uh, removal of constricted uh, structures like covers yeah. which are not adequate they should be identified as early as possible so that we can get in as part of the remedial works to remove them mm. now also we should also put in place measures to go to the public to educate people especially those who are living in the flat prone areas which the city authorities may not be able to remove. Mm -hmm. They should be able to, uh, they should identify those areas, and then as soon as we get the information that flood is approaching or a certain rainfall is coming, mm -hmm. then people should go in, persuade the people to evacuate those low-lying areas, mm -hmm. which those are short-term measures in a way. And then as part of that, we should also begin to go into areas of flood, early flood warning, mm -hmm. where uh, structures are put in place to yeah. determine how much flow will come from one area to the other so that these 
uh, when we have the uh, issues of uh, rainfall, we can quickly, by radio message, by telephone message, get to the public that, please, this flow is coming. This amount of water is coming. These are the communities that will be getting flooded. So those living in those areas move away right. from there to allow the flood because that is when we don't have money yeah. to develop the channels, at least we should be able to take the precautionary measures to make sure that people who are living in, in the, the, those low-lying areas are immediately removed before the flood comes right. so that we can save life. Right. If we are not doing that, then it means we are subjecting the public to unnecessary flooding and so on. And then there are attitudes, as you said, mm -hmm. about the waste management. They should make adequate preparations for waste uh, to be evacuated from communities. You know, most of the waste bins are put in communities closer to the drains. Now, if the drain, I mean, the waste bins are full and they are not evacuated, people think that, oh, from the waste bins, the next place to dump it is the drains. Hmm. So if you don't do all this, you don't prepare for all this, we will automatically be having waste in our bins, I mean, sorry, in, in our, our drains. drains. And this go in to choke our channels, our culvert. Not that sometimes it's not the issue of the engineer not designing the uh, culvert well. Maybe the culverts have been designed properly, but when you throw in refuse, the refuse go to choke the culverts, and these culvert points become points of uh, local flooding. You see, flooding occurs at a point where the culvert is uh, choked by waste. And then when you go over across the culvert, no flooding at all in that right. area. Right. So when these measures are put in place, we can at least take time to prepare for the long-term measures. We have for the long-term measures, they are quite enough. Mm. If you need to talk about mm. them, not today. Mm. We may not be able to finish yep. now. <laughs> and so let's go in for and the, the short-term measures. the impact won't yes. be felt immediately yes. as well. Mm. Yes, um, uh, Ms., um, Engineer Ben, yeah. you know, in talking about change in climatic conditions and all of that and being able to warn people living in low-lying areas ahead of time and all it brings into focus the role of the meteorological services yeah. here clearly um that 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 is an issue we need to look at accuracy of predictions and you know being able to be uh, you know, proactive in that regard for warn people and then for people to take the necessary measures your your, your, your take on that yeah th thank you but give me the opportunity he mentioned covet <laughs> uh, let me highlight some of the issues I have in my area. <laughs> uh, I know your platform is very big, so that we could be assisted. When you come to the Mampo municipality, there are about four areas that we have started experiencing flooding, which I will not be able to attribute it to anybody's siltation or anything. Number one is where we call Sumampem. It's very close to a secondary school, and any time it rains, that place gets flooded. Mm. It's all because the COVID is, is inadequate, as my senior colleague has mentioned. So I appeal to the authorities because we have a lot of school children crossing that area. And it links two major parts of the, the capital. That is the new site and then the town proper. Now, this one goes to Ghana Highway Authority. On the Kumasi Mampon, Ejra Road, there are some areas that get flooded. There's an area called Mampon Scap. In fact, it had washed the road away before. Mm. Anytime it rains on top of the mountains, a lot of water collects and then passes under the road at some point. The capacity is reducing increasingly. And oftentimes when you pass by, even though it's on the hill, there's a high propensity that the place will get flooded. So Ghana Highways Authority should take notice of that. Then there's another area, Tatafrum. They know when I mention it, mm -hmm. they know. The place also gets flooded. And then there's another major road, which is my last, permit me, uh, between Mampon and Kofiasi. There are three towns. Mm. Anytime it rains, we have two major markets in these areas. Anytime it rains, about a quarter of our population is cut off. Mm. One area is called Umwada. It's, it's, a, it's a shark valley. Anytime it rains, we don't have enough you know, passage of the water under the culvert. And the place was under construction. All of a sudden, the contractor has left the project. Mm. And we are appealing to authorities that whatever it takes to bring him back, let them do it. Then there's bring another the area contract. called Dadiase, mm -hmm. and then Ingwase. These areas cut off the people. 
And once we have an opportunity to talk about flats, I think they should mm. avail their I'm minds sure to that. Very, Going very back grateful. to the material <laughs> services, mm -hmm. I, in my professional opinion, disagree to an extent the global warming situation has an impact here. It has an impact. It has a global impact. But if you look at the statistics from Meteorological Services Department, Ghana has not experienced any extraordinary rain. Mm -hmm. That one can say that some global warming you know, has necessitated that. We have not experienced anything extraordinary. What has changed is that increasingly, we are ignoring our responsibilities as citizens and oftentimes, to some extent, as institutions. Let me touch on the metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies. We get people who obviously grant permits mm. for siting of buildings when they don't know exactly where it's going to be sited. So you go to some areas, people have block channels, but they have, they have permits. Mm. We have also, as a nation, ignored one important permit habitation permit or certificate. The fact that you have had permit to construct a building does not mean that just wake up and go and live in it. You also need a permit for somebody to come and assess the place and say that it is enough for you to inhabit the place. So there's a need for us to highlight all these things. I am not too sure that we can blame Matthew, Matthew services for inadequate projection. It used to be some years back. Now they are well equipped mm -hmm. and they are giving us very, very, very good information. If I have the opportunity to propose some solutions, public education for me is first, mm. as everybody agrees with. Let the people know that these are the spots that when we have rainfall of this intensity, we are likely to experience exactly. floods. So please move up, move up, do this, do We need to conscientize our people and give them some basic education. As but, to what uh, but to do, uh, we obviously, need to it, do can, it can't just come as you know, just informing them. There should be some help. Yeah. So Nadmo would come in yeah. in terms of how they are evacuated from their low lying oh, areas yes. to other areas mm -hmm. because just informing them to move. Oh, yeah, but, but really I'm, I'm sure if they Nadmo, don't have any Nadmo is, is doing that. I'm well aware to go. of that. That is the reporting aspect. Mm. We must also be bold enough to remove impeding structures. We must be bold enough. I remember in President Kufo's days that then. Minister for Works and Housing, uh, Honorable Kwamna Batels, started demolishing some buildings in areas. You look at the Densu River. You know, those areas were getting congested, so some demolition went on. But he was changed from the Works and Housing Ministry. But we don't know why those demolitions <laughs> are always, <laughs> you know, problematic. But quickly, in, in 30 seconds, wrap up for me, so okay. I can't talk. Then we need to also do the irrigation dams. Mm. Or dams, maybe it can, it can be for recreational purposes, as my, mm. my so senior colleague, down. the planner, mentioned, so that we'll be able to house the water, mm. delay it, or keep it for some other use, then greening. I am of the opinion that if we change our building regulations and say that maybe 10 to 15% of your area should be green, it will permit us to harvest the rain and to ensure that not all the water that drips on the soil must run into storm drains right. and other drains. They will be contained good for our benefit. So sure. it passed a law doing this, I am sure, mm. that we'll be able to contain a lot mm. more of the rain. And then my senior colleague also mentioned early warning signs. We have ignored this. We need to go back to it. People must be aware. And then re-engineering. Thank you very much. That's my last solution. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you much. We engineering. I come to you, Dr. <laughs> Kamita. Yes, if you could. Thank you very much. Yeah. Abner. Um, let me first of all use the occasion to wish the people of my hometown, Tapu, who are celebrating the Wola Festival today, a wonderful festive Wola uh, festival, and also wish the people of Nadoli Kaleo um, happy Easter. Now. Um, William Shakespeare, his shortest ode said that um, the memory of the dead as a warning to the living. In Chi, we say that se unimu wua hena. <laughs> now, the reason I'm mentioning this is in reference to engineer Ben, who mm -hmm. was talking about areas. At the time I started experiencing flooding, Kumase didn't have flats. Yeah. We sat down, mm -hmm. repeated the same mistakes, 
and now we have flats in Kumasi. We have flats elsewhere. Now, again, in my, my own uh, district, we have Sankana Dam, a very major big dam. Now, there is a small culvert that uh, uh, runs across the road, but the dam is big. So when there are heavy rains, that part of the road is covered. Mm -hmm. And people from Wa, from Kaleo, going to Tapo, mm, Sankana, you can't cross. Mm. And so we need to identify these places, make sure that once we, we don't have encroachment, we have the opportunity, uh, we call it uh, is, is a clean slate, we should be able to start implementing some of these things, planning them if we must, stopping people from encroaching before it is too late. We all know about the issues of Bagre Dam mm -hmm. in Burkina Faso. Every time they sneeze, we are flooded. We know about it. But what are the plans in place right. for us to ensure that these things are resolved? We need to not just say we are warning the people, but we need to say these are the plans going into the future to stop that problem yeah. happening. And again, I think uh, we can defer to these uh, dams and um, water collection points, using it for greenery, for agricultural purposes, to be able to resolve some of those problems. Sure. Um, my colleague also mentioned um, early warning systems and also providing information. Mm. Um, so many years ago in the UK, what they did was they developed what they call road data systems sorry, traffic data systems. What happens is that as you drive on the road, if there is a major traffic incident, regardless of which FM station you are on, it is interrupted and you are given the information. Right. We have our young guys who are very good in IT. Tech savvy. Mm. They can develop a system like that where we, we provide weather information systems. So you are driving in your car, you are listening to radio. If there is an incident somewhere, quickly ahead of time. it goes in, uh, um, automatically cuts off whatever channel you are listening right. to and provides that information. Right. So we should begin thinking about some of these thank things you. to be able to provide the very right well. sort of uh, information well. to the people. Very well, thank you very much. On that note, we bring uh, the conversation here to a close. We've been looking at the flooding situation in, in the country and how best we can deal with them. Even whilst we look at the long-term measures, what short-term measures can be implemented to help reduce the impact of the floods that occur here. Uh, in the studio with me have been engineer Ben Arthur, he's a civil engineer in labor and ADR practitioner. And also engineer Waisa Metepe, he's a registrar for the engineering council and Dr. Kaminta Bezier, he's a lecturer, Department of Planning, KNUSD. Thank you very much. And we'll also like to say a happy birthday to Ben Mensa and Thierry Nyan, both employees of TV3. Happy birthday to you all and that's coming in from my director, Brenda. I'd like to say a big thank you to you out there, listeners and viewers, for making a date with us. We'll be back here same time next week. Do have yourself a week.